Hello, my name is Johan Norberg, and my country, Sweden, is suddenly the center of the world's attention during this pandemic, because we have done things differently. In a world that closes borders and shuts down societies, Sweden seems suddenly like the last open society. And some think that we're crazy, and others think that we have intellectual self-confidence to trust science even during difficult times. Donald Trump thinks that Sweden is suffering very, very badly, while others, like Denmark's previous prime minister, thinks that Denmark should have done what Sweden did and trust its citizens. Who is right? Well, I won't be able to tell you, not yet, but I can tell you what Sweden has done so far, why it did, and what the results are so far. Sweden is an outlier not because of what we did, but because of what we did not do. Unlike our neighbors, we did not stop flights or close borders. We did not implement a state of emergency. There is no stay at home or shelter in place orders. Sweden has not shut down workplaces, has not shut down schools, apart from high schools and universities, which do distance learning. Sweden has not shut down normal city life, cinemas, restaurants, gyms, libraries, shopping centers, public transportation, and cafes. What Sweden has done is that the government has recommended social distancing, has recommended those over 70 of age not to spend time with others, not to socialize. It has recommended work from home if possible and to avoid long distance travel. There are some some enforced rules, uh, no public events with 50 or more people can take place, no concerts or theatres and, and the like, uh, like that, uh, even though spontaneous gatherings of more than 50 uh, cannot be broken up by, by police. Unlike other governments, police cannot stop people and ask them for papers and what they are doing. It does not fine people because they are too close to others in public. As the Swedish Social Democratic Prime Minister has said, we have to take responsibility as individuals. We can't ban all harmful behavior. It's not a matter of law, but of common sense and individual responsibility. So suddenly the Social Democratic Prime Minister sounds a little bit like a libertarian. And why is that? It's not because Swedes are all libertarians, no matter what you might have heard. I think there are four different reasons that explains the Swedish Sondervik in during this pandemic. And the first reason is that we have an administrative independence that is very much unlike uh, this is like what you have in most other Western democracies. It's a unique form of division of power, which we've had in Sweden since the 17th century, where governmental agencies are independent. Ministers appoint the director generals, but they're not supposed to tell them what to do. The director general is supposed to follow the laws and follow expert advice. And then the government is obviously free to take or not take that advice. But that has created a strong uh, tendency to listen to the agencies and follow their recommendations rather than um, going their own political way. And unlike other countries, that means that there's less space for political grandstanding, less room for uh, political uh, discretionary, arbitrary decisions during times of crisis. In fact, what Sweden has done so far follows the policies drawn up by many other health agencies around the world. It's just that they were overruled by politicians in other countries. And so far, that has not happened in Sweden. Uh, for example, in Denmark, the government suddenly decided to close Denmark's borders. And then the public health agency said that there is no scientific reason to do this. This is a political decision. Well, so far, political decisions like that have not been taken in Sweden. We followed the advice of the public health agency. Reason number two is Sweden's interpretation of the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. 
um, specifically do no harm by shutting down society and the economy when we don't know that that would for certain have a better health outcome. Sweden is a very trade dependent country and we suffer tremendously. Our exports industries suffer tremendously when other countries shut down its economy and then it seems reasonable not to hurt it even more by also shutting down domestic industries and the service industry. For a restaurant or a service industry, for a shop, losing 50% or 75% of your revenue is bad, but it's not as bad as losing 100%. We have a social democratic party in Sweden and trade unions that are pragmatic, often looking at the needs of the economy they know it's important for our jobs, for our future incomes, and for the health of the welfare state in the long run. Uh, the prime minister is a former trade union boss. He used to be head of the Swedish metal workers, and he's always been very concerned with the long-term health of the economy. Now, we don't know what is right this time around. There's disagreement when it comes to to the researchers, to public health authorities, and in that case, Sweden has decided to err on the side of caution, uh, because we know that shutting down the economy hurts. Poverty kills. The horrors of the lockdown is there, mental problems, domestic abuse, we know that. The horrors of unemployment and the risk of deaths of despair in the time of a deep economic crisis, but also long term. Poverty means less investment in, in drugs, in medical technology, less healthcare spending in the future. And Sweden has decided that we can't defeat the disease by killing the patient. Reason number three is that Swedish, the Swedish government thinks that it can accomplish some of the benefits of a lockdown without a lockdown. We have a high trust culture. Last, just like Scandinavian descendants in the US, those who migrated some 100 years ago to the US, who usually trust their neighbors and trust the authorities, follow regulations even though they're not implemented uh, through by force. And we shame those who don't follow that advice. And it, that seems to be working in Sweden to a large extent. You might have seen pictures of people socializing at restaurants and in bars in Stockholm. But that's, you might then have seen the same picture of the same restaurant at the same point in time, one of the few points in time when it was really crowded. That's not the experience in Stockholm when I go out and walk in town. It's fairly um, closed down um, by voluntary means. People are not out on town, they're not in crowding in bars and restaurants and cafes. An analysis of mobile location data points to a decline of 90% of long-distance uh, long travel in Sweden during the Eastern holiday. A dramatic change. 90% is not 1%, uh, and that is the difference. It gives more freedom for local information and for individual needs and that might mean that it is more sustainable in the long run because people can abide by it and make exceptions when they really really need to make an exception whereas in other countries where people are forced to follow the quarantine after a while they might just begin to break it because it's impossible to hold it when there are no exceptions most swedes abide by it anyway not everybody but it doesn't take everybody for the fourth reason. Reason number four is that the only way to beat the virus long term is immunity. We are trying in Sweden to slow the virus down to protect the healthcare system and to protect vulnerable groups, but not to suppress Suppress it. Other countries are locking down, but in that case, they will probably see a second wave and a third wave when they begin to open up and they might have to shut down again and go back and forth and thereby ruining societies, destroying the economy. In Sweden, it seems like the decision is that if it passes slowly through the population, we will have some sort of herd immunity in a few months. Uh, we allow vulnerable groups then to reconnect and we can get society working again. And then Sweden is in a position to send 
doctors and ventilators to places that are more vulnerable in, in that situation compared to others who might need new lockdowns and might not be able to even open borders before we have a vaccine because they will always see new cases imported from other places. According to one Harvard study, a 60% suppression of the corona is worse than a just a 40% or a 20% uh, slowdown of the virus because it creates a higher peak later on and more cases in total. Now, we don't know if that will be the result. Nobody knows. It depends on what we put into these models. But that is the decision that Swedish authorities have made. So those are the four reasons for Sweden's policy. And it has to be pointed out that those policies might change. There is pressure for a more restrictive policy from some loud voices in society. And interestingly, the most frequent argument is that every other country has chosen another policy. So why should we stand alone? Which seems like the argument from herd mentality rather than herd immunity. But so far, Swedes seems to be accepting these policies uh, broadly. There might be a 50-50 split, uh, but the ruling Social Democrats just jumped by a monthly record of seven percentage point in the last poll from 24% to 31%. So it seems like um, it is broadly rewarding them for this more cautious policy. Obviously, the opinion can shift at any point in time, and only time will tell. My personal point of view, I'm not an epidemiologist, I can't even pronounce the word. Um, it seems like uh, I'm, I'm obviously not an expert when it comes to these issues, but so far I'm broadly sympathetic to the Swedish model. Uh, restricting freedoms might be necessary during pandemics, but only when we have good reasons to assume that this will help us when it comes to our long-term health. And when we don't know, I think stick to what we do know. As John Stewart once put it, in every instance, the burden of making out a strong case lies not on those who resist, but on those who recommend government interference. So how are we doing so far? Is there a strong case against the Swedish model? And the simple answer is that we don't know yet, partly because it takes a long time to evaluate, partly because there are lies, damn lies, and COVID-19 statistics. For example, there are so many numbers and charts uh, in, in everywhere right now, and they try some try to explain that Sweden is a huge, ter and a terrible, horrible example of how we suffer because of this. Some try to explain that this is the role model for others, uh, and I wouldn't pay too much attention to any of them so far. For example, mortality rate as a percentage of cases is not a meaningful statistic. If some test everybody or almost everybody, like South Korea or Germany is getting close to, and some restrict tests to health personnel, then we will obviously see more death, a uh, higher death rates in countries that don't test as many. Sweden. Total death rates as a percentage of the population per capita is more reasonable, but there are many problems with those statistics as well. You might have seen different charts where Sweden is doing great or horrible depending on which country you compare it to. All is dependent on the comparison. It looks bad compared to Denmark and especially Norway, a country many, uh, many points to as a, as a role model. But it looks great compared to France, Belgium, the Netherlands and Britain. It looks bad compared to the United States, but Sweden looks much better compared to New York State, which is more similar in population and is at a similar stage of the spread. The truth is that Sweden is somewhere in the middle. And the problem is also that we count deaths differently. Some countries do not count deaths outside of hospitals. When people die of the coronavirus at home or in nursing homes, they're just not included in statistics. Whereas in Stockholm, 42% of the deaths have taken place in nursing homes. And many countries do not count those deaths in statistics. In Sweden, we constantly check the list 
people infected of the coronavirus against the population register and total deaths. So everyone who died and had the virus is counted. Whereas in a country like Norway, where you've seen statistically at least many, many fewer deaths than Sweden, deaths are only counted as deaths, deaths from the coronavirus if a doctor concludes that the virus killed the person in question and they then report this to the country's public health authority. However, I think that no matter how we count, we have more deaths per capita than our Nordic neighbors in Sweden, more than Norway, Finland, Denmark. But that is obvious because they've tried to suppress the virus through a lockdown by forcing people to stay at home. And in that case, they are going to see a second wave once they open up their societies, which they are, they are doing now. So they might get these deaths, but without getting the immunity. So we just have to wait for the data and for the evaluation, and it will take months before we have any reasonable way of assessing the different models. What is interesting in the Swedish case, and what we can say so far, is that there is no indication that most of those who have died would not have died anyway. Because they have not died because the healthcare system was overwhelmed during this period and we had a lack of care or ventilators. We still have a 20% excess capacity in Sweden of intensive care unit, uh, 20% um, of beds, of intensive care beds are unoccupied at the moment. Worse in the next few weeks, nobody knows, it's too early to tell, but at least it seems like Sweden and definitely Stockholm, which is ahead of the curve, is starting to stabilize. New patients admitted to intensive care has been stable in uh, Stockholm since March 23rd and in Sweden in total since March 23rd until April 15th uh, when I record this. And the um, average age of has been 81 Yes, and that's close to Sweden's average life expectancy. So it might be that excess mortality has not been much higher. Um, not that it seems like most of these deaths would have taken place anyway. Too early to tell, Sweden might suddenly take a turn for the worse, while countries who get out of the lockdown manage somehow to keep numbers low. And in that case, in Sweden, we have some serious uh, evaluation and discussion to... Um, has to take place, but it might just work out. And in that case, Sweden has protected the vulnerable during a period when we got more of immunity, more of herd immunity throughout society without ruining, destroying the society and the economy to the same extent that as others, and therefore human lives in the long run. And in that case, I'm guessing that there will be difficult questions to answer for other governments who hurt their societies without gaining any health benefit, even in the shorter run. I don't know what's going to happen, but I will just leave you with this thought. The coronavirus was a wake-up call. Uh, it is not as horrible as some of us thought it could be in the beginning. It does not have the combination of contagiousness and mortality as, for example, the Spanish flu had 100 years ago. And the best thing is that it seems to spare our young. But we might not be this lucky next time around. The next time we have a pandemic, next time might be much worse. This is the time to prepare and gather knowledge about what works and what doesn't. And therefore, we also need different solutions to the problem to see what works and what doesn't, to be better prepared the next time around. We need experts. And Sweden is not the experiment here. The rest of you are. We have never shut down societies and economies to this extent. And it will take a long time before we understand the effects of doing something that drastic. And I think that everybody, and especially everybody else who, uh, around the world who has attempted a pretty aggressive experiment should be happy that Sweden has tried another path.